Hello and welcome to the program today. It is a pleasure to have you along, a pleasure to be able to bring God's Word to you. I hope you'll stay around. We're going back into this message series, Invisible Stakes, What's Holding You Down? Great revelation. Stay around. I'll be back in just a few minutes. I was teaching an adult Sunday school class and I said, do you remember what we taught on last week? And uh, one of the guys spoke up that had gone to school with me. He's a smart aleck. And he said, don't flatter yourself. So from that point on, I thought it was necessary to do reviews. <laughs> so I do that. Uh, that's what we're going to do just for a few moments today. John chapter 10, verse 10. You guys probably know this scripture. Jesus talking, he said, The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I heard somebody say this was a dividing line for them. And it has been for me too. Once I learned this, I mean, you don't have to question a lot of things. Was God making me sick so I can, uh, no way. The thief cometh not but for. That phrase means the only purpose he has is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, I've told you numerous times this word more abundantly in the Greek means superabundant in quantity, superior in quality, and it goes on to say that the word implies excessive which is pretty cool. He said that's what he came for. Jesus said that's what he came for for us. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, the NIV version says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. The thing that is so interesting about Jeremiah chapter 29 is Israel was in POW camp at the time. They were off in bondage to Nebuchadnezzar's seizing of Jerusalem. And they were in a foreign country. They were over a thousand miles away from home, controlled by people that did not believe in God, Jehovah. And, and uh, God said, here's my plans I've got for you. And you're thinking, God, if that's your plans, why don't you get me out of here? Uh, why don't you change things for me? But the thing that we need to understand is God has plans for us that we need to work the plans. If we don't work the plan, just because God has a plan for you, nothing is going to change. There will always be things that oppose God's plan and His will and His promises for your life. There will always be something trying to take priority, priority over you living the abundant life. Go with me to Matthew 16. We're still in review mode here. Some of you think, well, this is new. Well, see, that's what I told you. I need to review. Matthew chapter 16. When I found this, when I find things in the Scripture that seem to be, um, when they seem to contradict one another somewhere, I've got to make clear for myself what the Scripture is saying. Because it, it, it is easy to look at certain scriptures, and if you just isolate certain scriptures, you'll think, oh, that contradicts this scripture, or that contradicts this scripture. This area of scripture felt like that to me for a long time. And you know what most of us do when we find something that contradicts the way we believe? We skip on over it and read something else. I like to find out what it's saying. And so we're going to break into this again today. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself or refuse himself. We'll talk about himself in just a minute. And take up his cross and follow me. Now, this word take up, I've told you this in the last couple of times that we've taught on this. It means to lift, to take up or take away. To, the Part of the Greek definition is to weigh anchor. Everybody know what that is? It means you pull your anchor up. Everybody been in a boat or you've been around a boat enough to know that if you want to stay still in a boat, if you're fishing, you find a good fishing spot, you drop your anchor down. If you want to move, you don't leave your anchor down. You weigh anchor is what it's called. I don't know why they came up with that terminology, but it's old, obviously, at least 2,000 years old. To weigh anchor means to pull the anchor up so you can move. So Jesus said, if any man is going to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. This word cross in the original Greek is not a cross like we see it, like Jesus being crucified on. It is defined as a stake 
Watch this. It's defined as a stake or a post. The Greek word actually says something that will cause you to abide or to stand still, something that's got you staked down. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me. Now, this makes sense now, doesn't it? If you're going to follow me, you can't just be staked down to something. You got to pull your stake up and you got to follow me. Now, I want you to notice this again. He said, verse 25, and whosoever shall save his life, this word life should have been translated soul. I don't know how it got life in the King James Version. Your soul is your mind, will, intellect, your emotions, your reasoning. He said, whosoever shall save or protect his soul shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his soul, same word again, for my sake shall find it. Now, you have the ability to change how you think what you do with your soul, your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotions, your reasoning. If you didn't, you'd be somebody that is in a futuristic movie that has nanorobots inserted in their bloodstream so that, that the evil, evil person can take control of you. But the fact is, you're a human being, and God made you with the ability to make choices. You can make good ones. You can make bad ones. I've tried to get God to quit me to make me quit making bad choices. Anybody in the room? Yeah, look, y'all smiling or shaking your head, everybody waving. Do you notice he didn't make you stop? He gave you a choice. You have the choice to make good, you can make good decisions, bad decisions. That's all up to you. Now, you can learn to think on a higher level. Your, your, th your thought, your, your, your reasoning can get on a higher level. Your intellect can get on a higher level. You know how, how, how you, you get a higher level of in intellectual? You hang around people that's on a higher level of intellectual than you are, intellectually. Uh, you you got to expose yourself to something different. Now watch, look at verse 24. Then said Jesus to his disciples, if any man, I want you to see it again, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's, that's mentioned, that phrase is said four times in the New Testament. Every time the word cross is translated as stake or a post, something that causes you to stay still, take up is always translated to weigh anchor or to pull it up or pull it, take it away. Now, I want to say this again. I said this in, in the first meeting that we did on this. This does not say, and Jesus did not say, you need to pick up your cross and carry it and follow me. That's what people have translated this, these four areas of Scripture in the New Testament to say. I've heard people say, well, you know, I got this thing here, and I'm, I'm just carrying my cross for Jesus. I've heard people say that. Maybe you've heard people say that before. I've heard preachers say stuff like that. Now, you're going to have a cross. You're going to have to carry your cross. That's not what Jesus said. Look, listen, Jesus went to the cross in substitution for you to take your place. Jesus never tells you to carry anything that he's already carried for you. Jesus never tells you to pay for anything that he's already paid for for you. Do you think it would be ridiculous that you'd go to a restaurant somewhere and pay for the meal and your friends that are with you, you paid for everybody's meal, and about the time they were getting ready to walk out, the waitress would walk up and say, hey, hey, you, you need to pay for the meal. You'd say, my buddy already paid for the meal. You'd say, uh, you pay for the meal too. You were here. Do you think that would be ridiculous? Why would you think that you would pay for something that Jesus already paid for? Why do you think you would pick up a cross that Jesus already carried for you and start carrying that cross all over again? That's the devil deceiving people into thinking that they have to condition themselves to be slaves to his mentality. It's a world mentality is what it is. Jesus never instructed anyone to redo what he has already done. You can take control of your soul, your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotion, your reasoning. Let me tell you something. I was controlled by a spirit of fear which deals with your mind horribly. I don't know if anybody has ever dealt with any of that stuff or not, but as a child, 
And I love my dad, I love my mom, my family, but my dad had a horrible spirit of fear that messed with him, and it passed to every one of the kids. All of us have dealt with fear. Fear not only is something in your mind, it gets down in your spirit, but the way it controls you is for you to, it to make you think about it all the time. You think about what you're afraid of. You can't even explain to people why you're afraid of something. It's a spirit that begins to drive something in you. You can take control of your soul. I've learned to do it. Fear will never control me again. Right. Now, I'm smart. I'm never going to jump out of an airplane again when the plane is doing well. I did that once with a parachute on and broke my leg. I think it's one of the only broken bones I have in my body because I love me. So, so I'm not going to do that again. Somebody said, well, you're just a chicken. No, I'm a smart. <laughs> it hurt, and it hurt for a long time. And every once in a while, it tries to remind me that it was broken and not set. And I tell it to shut up, it's healed. And I move on with things. Um, stupid and faith is not the same thing. Does everybody understand that? Faith means that you're persuaded of what someone told you is true. Stupid means you're doing something you shouldn't be doing and you know better in the first place and you're probably going to reap some bad results from it. You can take control of your soul, your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotion, your reasoning. Well, you know, we were just raised a certain way and that's the way we are. You don't have to stay the way you were raised. My, I remember my dad saying, I want one of my sons, this was before Anita was born, she was a surprise to all of us, um, <laughs> see, it's a good surprise, she said. But he said, I want one of my sons to be a doctor, one of them to be a lawyer, and one of them to be a dentist. You know why he said that? Because he worked at a plant all of his life until he started pastoring full time. He wanted us to have so much money that we could do anything we wanted to do. He wanted us to be better than us. I remember dad told me somebody stopped him in Kroger one day and said, we'd started on television back 1988, local television. And dad said, one of his buddies stopped him and, and said, you know, your boys on television said, that Charles, he's, he's preaching better than you are. You better watch him. Dad said, I'd hope he'd preach better than I preach. He's my son. He's my offspring. He's supposed to be better. I don't know where we've gotten the mentality that we're supposed to stay down on the same level that we were born into. We're supposed to always be rising up. That's not something of being arrogant or proud. That's growing. That's seed time and harvest. You can take control of your soul, your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotion, and the way you reason things. You can take control of that. Some of you, under the sound of my voice, deal with the spirit of fear. You need to learn how to deal with that spirit. Instead of letting it control you, you need to speak to it, tell it to shut its mouth, just like you'd talk to a person. Did you hear me? Just like you talk to fear, you're not going to control my life. You just, well, get out of here. Get out of my life. Get out of my mind. Get out of my spirit. You do not have a hold on, it, on me. I'm a child of Almighty God. I'm controlled by the power of the Word of God, not by your foul spirit. You'll get out. That's the way you deal with those things. You need to do it on a regular basis. If it starts cropping up again, you need to speak to it. Tell it to shut its mouth and get out of your life. The battle is almost always inside, not outside. If it were outside, I'd gather up a few people like Joe and Butch. Mikey, I'd take you with me. Some big, mean people, you know. Well, I mean, they don't have to be mean, just be big and controlling. Mean. Bobby, I'd take you. Bobby, Bobby got long hair. He looks mean. He's got that little mean look to him, you know. Rick, you're a little too soft look. I mean, I love you, but you look, you know, just nice. I'd take some mean looking people with me. You know, somebody could just put on a little mean. And then if it all failed, I'd take Kelly. <laughs> Let her crawl up and down somebody. <laughs> it's not, here's the deal though, it's not outside. What you, if it was a natural stake driven out here in this parking lot, I could get some power equipment and pull it up but it's not a natural stake. It's an invisible stake. And those are the kind of stakes that can hold people down. And many times they don't even understand what they are because they've not discovered what they are. You need to discover them. 
to follow God's instruction, to live his plan for your life, to live the abundant life, there will always be things that you have to break free from. Maybe you've been conditioned to believe that there are things holding you back, holding you down, that in actuality, you have the ability to pull them up, to break free from them. I've, I've had people tell me, well, I can't do this because. And they'll go through a whole list of things. And I said, but, but you can change that. Well, I don't know. Somebody told me. See, there's a lot of people listen to people more than they listen to God. I just wonder how well off we'd be if we'd pay more attention to God. I, know, I don't need to wonder. I know how. We'd be so much better off if we'd pay attention to God instead of paying attention to people. <laughs> Your mind will place all kinds of false limitations on you. It can be people or things that condition your mind to make you think you're stuck somewhere. You remember in this first, the first message that we did on this, invisible stakes? I, I did some research on how they train a circus elephant. They take a circus elephant when they're first born, when they start standing up, they tie a chain around their leg and they tighten a thing uh, on the end of it to fit their leg so that they can feel it on their leg and they drive a deep stake in the ground. So the elephant, when it walks out and finds that it can't get loose, starts struggling. And, and my research said that they'll struggle for about two weeks. And after two weeks, they know when they get to the end of the chain, they stop. And then when they do that, the circus trainer can put a rope around their leg and drive a little wooden peg in the ground. And as soon as he feels it tugging on his leg, he backs up and goes back toward the stake again. A full-grown elephant, they do that as the elephant even grows up, a full-grown elephant can lift 20,000 pounds. You know how much a human can lift? One, about one-third of his weight. I can only, I can only lift about Don't lie. 50 pounds, 60 <laughs> pounds. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding> you. <laughs> about one-third of your weight. I mean, think about that for a minute. But a full-grown elephant can lift about 20,000 pounds. He, he's got a wood stake in the ground with a rope around his leg, and he won't move past that. Isn't that amazing? You know what that is to a human? About like a thread tied to a toothpick. And when you feel the least little tug, whoop, that's as far as I can go. And there's people that live their lives like that every day. I can't do this. I can't do that. Well, my mom and dad only had. Well, so-and-so told me that. And, and they live their lives like that. Some of you guys have dreams that God has placed on the inside of you, and, and you, you've maybe pursued them a little bit, and then you've done nothing with them. Some of you have never even pursued the dreams that God has placed inside of you because you've been convinced by somebody that there are stakes that are holding you back. False limitations can keep you staked down to your past accomplishment. That's as high as I can get, what I did on the, in the past. God's always got another level for you. I had a friend of mine that told me one day, Kelly and I started dating. Everybody, I hope everybody has got enough sense to know she's a little bit younger than me. Uh, she has had about $200,000 worth of plastic surgery. It makes her look a lot younger than she, I'm just kidding you. She has not. <laughs> she's quite a bit younger than me. A friend of mine was dating a younger lady at the time when Kelly and I were dating about 20 years, almost 21 years ago when we first started dating. And he said, let me tell you something about younger women. He said, I've dated a, a couple younger women. He said, just think about this for a minute. He said, if you have one unique experience in a day, just something unique to you, just an experience that you experienced something. He said, in one year, you have 365 experiences more than they have. In 10 years, you've got 3,650 more experiences than they had if, they're ten, if you're 10 years. Now, I know that doesn't carry straight across the board, but when you think about your own life, you shouldn't be going down as you get older. You should be going up as you get older. You should be having those experiences to be a life experience for you that can train you and teach you to move to a higher level, not fall down to a lower level, not to give up. I grew up in a church atmosphere that made us believe that anything good that would happen in your life, God had to do it. And our, 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 response, or our, our thinking was, 
God had to directly do it if it was good in our lives. And I want to be clear, I believe that every good gift, every perfect gift comes from God, but I also believe that God has placed the ability in mankind to determine his own destiny. I can't determine your destiny for you. I can't determine how much of the Word of God you'll have or how much of the promises of God you'll experience in your life, but you can. You have the ability to do that. Yeah, how much work, how much, how much time are you going to invest in that? I've used this example before. You know, people go to school, a regular school, 12 years. What do they call that? Some kind of school? 12 years? 12 year school. Um, <laughs> 12-year school is what it is. Uh, you go to college, people go to college, most four years. What do you get when you get out of college? Four years, a bachelor's degree. And then you got to go two more years, to get a master's degree. Is that right? And, and what about a doctor's degree? Another two years? So you got 20 years of schooling. You know if you specialize in certain medicines that you have to go another two years, sometimes three years for specialization? That's 23 years. Joe's smiling because he thinks I'm going to tell people how long he went to college. And did, how many, how many years? Okay, you shouldn't have smiled. You should have just sat and nodded. How many years did you go to college? Seven? Seven and a half. Seven and a half. And you were going to be a sports medicine? Yep. What was it? Sports medicine, not a doctor. No. Just a sports medicine person. Athletic trainer. I asked him one day, I said, how much do those guys make? He said, about $25,000 a year. I said, you could manage a McDonald's for $25,000 a year <laughs> and not have to go to seven and a half years of college. You know what he found out in the last couple of years of college that he was in? That he could make all kinds of money as a mortgage broker. He went to work for a mortgage company, and he's been in the mortgage business ever since then. Did you actually graduate? Yeah. You got a, what kind of degree you got? Bachelor's, Bachelor's degree. See there? <laughs> and do you know you can't hardly get some people to come to church to listen to the God that come wrote on. your life manual for you? Yeah. You can't get some people to pick this up and read it 10 minutes a day, but yet they'll go to 23 or 24 or 25 years of college. My first cousin went to, to college and became an OBGYN. He spent 12 years, four years. Uh, two years and two years, I think. He said, I wish I'd have become an engineer, is what he's told me. Hmm. I wish I'd have studied the Bible more. I, I wish I'd have found out what God had to say about all this stuff instead of what everybody else had to say about it all. Right. Do you know that God put laws in place that govern things? And uh, those laws are defined, that word law, Old Testament, New Testament, is defined as a regulator or a governor. Those things are in place. Your life is controlled by laws, things that regulate and govern you. Do you know that faith is a law? The Bible says it's a regulator. It governs things in your life. Hope is a law. Expectation is what that word hope means. It's, it's, it governs things in your life. Do you know that love is a law? Have a deliberate attitude to do good. The agape love. It's a law, the Bible said. It governs things in your life. It regulates things in your life. Do you know that sin is called a law? Yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah. Let's think about that for just a second. You mean if I start sinning, going against the Word of God, blatantly against His Word, that it starts regulating things in my life? You don't have to think about that very long, do you? All of those laws are in place in the Scripture. You can't abolish those laws because they're laws from God. You make good things happen more than God makes good things happen in your life. I didn't expect to get a big response from that. You make bad things happen in your life more than the devil makes bad things happen in your life because of the laws that God has already set in place. God has given you the ability to choose what happens in your own life. I'm not talking to children today. I'm talking to adults, people that have the ability to make choices and do something about the choices. In the Bible, this process is known as seed time and harvest, that you reap what you sow. If you sow bad seeds, you reap bad fruit. You sow good seeds. Is this basic, but does everybody know this? It's a reminder area in the message.
Thank you so much for joining me on the program today. I'm trusting that revelation is growing inside of you, that you're more interested in the word than you are religion. That's what this message series is going to do. It's just going to destroy religious tradition that holds down the word of God and causes it not to work for your life. I want you to order the entire series, Invisible Stakes. You can order one of three ways. You can go to our website. You can call that number that's on the screen or you can just write. I want to thank you for ordering the products. The money goes back into ministry. You're really helping us make a positive difference in people's lives around the world. If you're being blessed by the ministry here at Empowered, well, you can help us be a blessing to others by sowing a seed this month. Here's how you partner with us. Empowered Ministries is dedicated to reaching our world with the love of Jesus Christ. Your financial support is helping us extend God's grace to the multitudes and empowering us to reach the lost, heal the sick, feed the hungry, and to bring hope to the hopeless. Through Empowered Television, we're impacting nations by teaching believers to thrive in their calling and to live successful, powerful, and productive lives. If you're being blessed by the ministry here at Empowered, you can help us continue to do the works of Jesus by sowing a seed this month. With your gift of any size, you'll receive our monthly partner letter. And with your gift of $41 or more, we will also include a special teaching by Pastor Charles Vance that will take your faith to another level. When you become an EMT partner, you are helping us transform lives around the world. And we believe what you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. Thank you so much for your gifts of support. We appreciate you more than words can tell. We're praying for you every day. I want to pray with those of you who are not born again or you're not sure about your relationship with God. I want you to know Jesus loves you, has an extraordinary plan for your life. Jesus already paid for your sins. It's a done deal as far as his part is concerned. Now it's up to you to believe what he's done, accept him into your life, let him start changing your life from the inside out. Will you pray with me? Come on, it's your time. Say this out loud. Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus into my life. I confess him as my Lord, my master. I believe he died for my sins, and Father, you raised him from the dead. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, meant it from your heart, welcome to the family of God. We've put together a get started packet for new Christians. It's our gift to everyone that's prayed with us today. You can get yours by going to our website, charlesvance.org. Press the new believers tab, fill out that information. We will get that packet right back out in the mail to you and then get in a faith-based church somewhere and always remember, stay in the word. You will stay empowered.